Very excited to be joined today by Peter Goodman. He is the global economics correspondent for the New York Times, and more importantly for our purposes, let's put this up on the screen. He's the author of a terrific new book, How the World Ran Out of Everything, that takes a look at the catastrophe of the supply chain on every level during COVID and also takes it back to, you know, the origins of what created so much fragility and some lesson learns, lessons learned for moving forward. Great to see you, Peter. Congratulations on the book. Good to see you. Great to see you guys. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm. So I just gave my little synopsis, but why don't you talk about why you wanted to write this book? Because you were covering all of these, you know, major backups, snafus, shortages, et cetera, as they were unfolding. Right. I mean, I never expected to write about such a wonky subject as the global supply chain. I mean, it's kind of in everything that I've written about for the last three decades. Uh, But to go hard at it, I mean, it happened really because we all discovered that this system that we don't think about, I mean, it's a series of overlapping systems, a whole army of people who make our products and get them to our door. It just kind of buckled and collapsed right when we needed it most. I mean, I I was living in London in lockdown, had a baby born in the first wave of the pandemic. Our son was born on April 8th, 2020. And my wife was pretty stoic about the fact that, you know, I couldn't be in the hospital uh, an hour after he was born. Uh, We couldn't get the usual National Health Service checkups and her parents couldn't fly in from New York to help with the baby. But where we all just kind of lost it was then we get home and we discover that we can't find hand sanitizer anywhere and we can't even find the ingredients to make hand sanitizer. Uh, and it, this was just sort of cosmically bewildering. And I think most people can relate to that. So as I found myself writing about all of the constituent components of this collapse, the container shipping crisis, the supposed shortage of truck drivers and warehouse workers, which was really just the result of downgrading people's jobs to the point where we ran out of people willing to do them in the middle of a pandemic, I realized that this was indeed a book. Right. I mean, no, I, you did a fantastic job here. And uh, we have this book review, which I think is really hits at the crux of what we're talking about. We can put it up there on the screen. Was global trade a mistake? Hmm. Uh, you you can tell us whether you agree with that question or not. But most importantly, you focus in on just-in-time manufacturing and how the entire modern consumer economy was constructed around this global uh, exchange of goods. And that with a supply shock like the pandemic, it threw things things for a loop that had devastating consequences for a lot of American consumers. So where do you fall on the question and specifically here with just-in-time manufacturing? Well, I don't think global trade or just-in-time manufacturing are mistakes. I think the mistake was allowing a system to be constructed by publicly traded profit-maximizing corporations that were largely deregulated, you know, to do these things while we're in the thrall of this kind of ruthless form of efficiency that, as I demonstrated in the book, isn't actually that efficient. Uh, We can get into this in detail, but, you know, one of the most incredible things I discovered in the book was in the middle of pandemic, rail companies were actually sending cargo to the wrong destinations intentionally, resulting in delays and product shortages because they were so obsessed with proving to Wall Street that they were lowering their dwell time. You know, this Mm. metric that had currency on Wall Street, that's how long cargo sits in any particular place. So I I found this uh, engineer in Idaho who was just uh, appalled to discover that he's hauling things to the wrong destinations because some guy running a rail yard in Nebraska is just attaching cargo to whatever the next train is that's moving out of there, never mind uh, who happens to be waiting for that cargo. So the mistake was allowing monopoly companies, you know, to develop. I mean, a, a lot of the the industries that I'm writing about, transportation, meatpacking, have, you know, leaders who have market share that would make the robber barons blush. And just in time was this idea, you know, pioneered by Toyota at the end of the Second World War, that instead of just making as much stuff as we possibly could, a la Henry Ford, uh, just make what you need to replenish the cars that you've already sold, get your suppliers to bring parts and raw materials to the assembly line just as you need them. That worked out very well for Toyota. It dropped uh, consumer prices very low. It did reduce a lot of waste, but along comes, again, the paramountcy of shareholder interest, 
I spent a lot of time looking at the role of McKinsey and other consultants in turning just in time into this crude imperative for companies to just slash inventory to the bone, take the money that they used to waste as they see it, uh, stick in you know, parts and warehouses as a hedge against trouble like the pandemic, uh, and then just give the money to themselves through executive compensation, through bonuses, through dividends and share buybacks that make the investor class unhappy, but leave the rest of us running out of all sorts of vital things, you know, basic chemicals to make medicines, protective gear in the middle of the pandemic, computer chips, which means we can't make medical devices. I mean, we are still right now paying the costs of this excessive embrace of just in time. I think one of the most important reasons to read your book also is to really wrap your head around some of the ways that we were really lied to during this period of time. Um, for example, a sort of micro example, you know, we were told, oh, there's this shortage of, of truckers. Like people just, they don't want to work. Right. They just don't want to work hard. So there's right. not enough truckers. So, you know, what we need to do is actually get Congress to fund these education programs that, by the way, we, right. the trucking companies, are going to nobly run. And I'm sure that's not, you know, that's not a kickback whatsoever. Instead of actually looking at the fact, you've made it so people cannot live on these jobs. You're putting them in massive right. debt. Of course you have a shortage of truckers because you've made the job so incredibly miserable. And then at the macro level, so that's a sort of micro example that I, I'd love you to talk more about because I think it's sure. a really, really important one. But also at the macro level, you know, the big story about inflation wasn't, they, they'd say something about the supply chain, but the real problem was that people got money during the pandemic. Oh, they got the child tax credit. They got those direct checks and people went out there and they were spending money like crazy. And that was the, that was the one and only cause of inflation was right. this spending that benefited average people. Your book really takes a look at the way that that at its core was also an incredible lie in service of, you know, people who, in service of people's ideological project, in service of hiding these corporate shenanigans also, and just uh, sort of greedy profit maximization that you expose as well. Yeah, I really appreciate that careful read. Um, it's true that time and again, I mean, this, this to, to me is sort of reminiscent of how, you know, the subprime mortgage crisis gets blamed or really the derivatives crisis that then trashes the financial system, that trashes the, the regular economy that all of us depend on. That gets blamed on poor people, you know, who are greedy about buying houses and, instead of the Wall Street players who gorged on synthetic derivatives. And, you know, again, we're told to your point, Crystal, that, yeah, inflation is you know, the cause of, uh, is the result of having, you know, helped people who were thrown out of work or who couldn't pay uh, their bills. And, you know, they went out and just extravagantly blew it all on Pelotons and the supply chain couldn't handle it. Now, now we're dealing with inflation. Uh, I mean, the, the, the reality is that engineered scarcity is part of our global economy. Uh, and monopoly power is not some sort of accident. It's the result of corporate strategies. And, you know, in, in fact, uh, you know, I tell the story of how uh, the Trump administration used an executive order to keep workers laboring in slaughterhouses, uh, even when it was very clear that they were super spreaders, when local public health authorities across the country said, we've got to shut these plants down, people are getting sick. And the Trump administration dropped this executive order that forced, uh, among others, a woman whose story I tell in the, in the book, a, a refugee from Myanmar named Tin Ai, who kept going to work, was one of five people who died at the Greeley, Colorado plant owned by JBS Foods. This is the world's largest meat packer. It's run by two convicted felons from Brazil uh, who fraudulently amassed tens of billions of dollars to buy up slaughterhouses. Four companies control 85% of the meatpacking capacity in the United States. And the cynicism of this executive order was, was premised on the idea that if we don't keep people laboring in slaughterhouses, Americans are gonna go hungry. And in fact, as I reveal in the book, at the time when this order drops, the meat packers, including JBS, are sitting on record volumes of frozen product. They're exporting product to China, among other places. So we asked Tin Ai and other slaughterhouse workers to sacrifice their lives in the name of feeding everyone, where really we were just funneling fatter profits to monopoly companies. And that is the reveal of this book again and again, uh, that we, we blame, uh, to your point, truck drivers for somehow losing their appetite for driving trucks. 
Uh, we've got 10, I'm sorry, we've got three times as many people as we need with commercial driver's licenses in the United States. Uh, why is it that so many people walk away from truck driving? Well, I spent three days riding along with a truck driver from Kansas City down to Dallas and back in the middle of winter. And boy, I can tell you from having slept in the bunk for a couple of nights, from being there as this driver is worrying about where I'm going to, where's he going to park? Uh, he's got to caffeinate enough to not fall asleep at the wheel, but not so much that he has to stop and use the restroom. I mean, these are the sorts of thoughts that fill the heads of people we're entrusting to deliver stuff while we're asking them to be away from their families, uh, to have less and less control over their schedules, to be at the mercy of this just-in-time system where we basically treat them like their own time and their family time is limitless and valueless. Yeah, I mean, Peter, one of the things that you write about is that, uh, and also that they mentioned in the review, you're not naive enough to think that this is just going to go away, but we are going to have to reach some equilibrium. What does the future look like? I mean, we're going to, we have to welcome this labor mobilization because, you know, Henry Ford, who's a very problematic character who I use quite a bit in the book, he did know a thing or two about supply chains and mass assembly. Uh, he said directly as he doubled wages for workers in 1914 and, and was called a communist by parts of uh, mm -hmm. the, the business world. He said, look, I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm trying to make my products, trying to drop the price really low so they can have mass appeal. Uh, and I need people showing up for work who aren't worried about paying their own bills and who are happy to be there and feel part of it. It's a, and he specifically said any business that's premised on low wage labor is inherently unreliable. So we should embrace the fact that, you know, rail workers, I traveled with uh, uh, traveling maintenance crews, that they've managed to extract some paid sick leave, not enough, but some through Biden's bully pulpit, uh, resolving their threat of a strike. We should uh, we should be happy that dock workers who are often treated as sort of aristocrats of the supply chain, you know, their only move is to threaten to monkey wrench the supply chain to get uh, more job security in the face of automation. We should be glad that they're well paid. I mean, those are those are tough jobs. Truck driving has always been a difficult job, but back when the Teamsters were in charge, you know, another problematic institution, but nonetheless uh, a, a, an illustration of what happens to wages and working conditions when there's strong labor power. Uh, we didn't have a shortage of truck drivers back when the Teamsters were in charge. So we don't want to go back to the 70s. We don't want the government setting the prices of everything, but we need more transparency in the market. Uh, we need the international shipping cartel, something we haven't talked about. You know, there's basically three alliances like air alliances that dominate the most lucrative routes across the Pacific and from Asia to Europe. Uh, we need regulation so that these entities are treated more like utilities. I mean, utilities make money. Uh, they're profit-making entities, but we understand that electricity is really vital. We don't think about it much, but when it fails, we sure do. And we need to take the same approach to these crucial components of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, I have a media question for you, which is, yeah, I'm thinking specifically about the, the meat shortage thing, which I yeah. saw covered, you know, credulously across a lot of media outlets of, oh my God, there's going to be a meat shortage. And, oh, I guess we just have to keep these slaughterhouses going. What are you going to do? You may have written about it and I missed it, but I didn't see reported anywhere what you just said about how actually they were sitting on this tremendous surplus. They were, you know, selling to China and had frozen and freezers and whatever. The, this was never actually going to be an issue. So why is that? Why was the, oh, we're going to run out of bacon and we're going to run out of pork story? Why did so much of the media run with that and not actually even do just the basics of checking? Like, is this even actually true? Well, I think it would have been hard to check the part about the surplus in real time because it took Congress actually using its power to demand documents uh, mm. to, to produce some emails that brought that home. But I will say this, you know, I mean, it's not just my colleagues in the media. Um, it's also, you know, mainstream economists. I mean, we no. like to think about supply and demand because we learned about it in textbooks in college and grad school. And let's face it, supply and demand is a really beautiful model that does explain certainly part of these supply chain shocks. I, I think that m market concentration uh, and monopoly power, you know, these are things that we're kind of trained not to think about. And the economists who are easiest for beat reporters to get hold of generally work for companies that are interested in making equities go up. I mean, that, that's just the reality. That's not some sort of conspiracy. That's just the reality that 
a reporter who's on deadline, who needs an economist to make sense of some arcane subject that they don't really know about, they need to get expert enough to write about in the next 15 minutes, can mm -hmm. easily get hold of somebody at a bank that's invested in making equities go up to go find somebody who really understands monopoly power. There's a good chance that person is at some nonprofit and they're busy dealing with some kid, sick kid who's home from school or you know they can't afford child care. I mean, it, it, there's just friction in the system there. Uh, and it's, it's so it's not something that we're trained to think about much. Once you start to see monopoly power in the economy, you can't unsee it. Uh, right. Once you're there, you're there. And I do hope that my book will be part of, I think, a movement amongst those of us thinking about it uh, to bring that home for people. And, and I hope no one will ever see a package that lands at their door, you know, the same ever again. Hopefully. And my last question, Peter, is, um, you know, obviously, you learned a lot. Your book is helping us learn a lot about what actually went wrong during the pandemic, about how this almost like religious devotion to cutting inventory created all this fragility that, you know, wasn't right. in the interest of anyone, uh, wasn't even in the interest, medium to long term interest of these these companies that were uh, so, you know, devoted to that direction. But do you think that in a, on a deeper sense, like the country those companies, policymakers actually learned anything from what should have been an incredibly searing experience? I think policymakers have learned something. I mean, I think it's not an accident that the Biden administration is now engaging in industrial policy, whatever you think about that. Uh, and we're you know, spending tens of billions of dollars in subsidies to make sure that computer chips are made in the United States. There's, there, there's a concerted effort to make sure that the electric vehicle industry uh, has time to develop in the U.S., which is why there are trade protections against Chinese imports. Again, reasonable people can disagree about the permutations of this. I mean, I talk to people all the time who say climate change is not going to wait for us to sort out the trading rules. You know, we, we need to buy what's needed right now to deal with that crisis. Uh, but clearly, there's been a, a policy shift in the United States. In terms of uh, the people who run publicly traded corporations, Yes, there's a push to diversify away from heavy reliance on China. I mean, I just came back from a couple of weeks in India where Walmart is uh, shifting production uh, that used to be in China. It's not an abandonment of China. China is going to continue to be, you know, right at the center of global manufacturing, but it's a, it's a sort of marginal shift. I mean, 15 years ago, if you flew down to Bentonville, Arkansas, and you were trying to get your product on the shelf of a superstore, uh, the Walmart buyer would ask you, well, where's this product made? And if the answer was something other than China, you had a problem because that indicated that you weren't making it at the cheapest possible price or at the most efficient scale. And now if the answer is only China, you have a problem. Uh, you know, you that's viewed as you're putting us at risk of these geopolitical shifts. I mean, you got the Trump tariffs on uh, imports from China. Now the Biden tariffs continued. Whoever wins the presidential election in November, you could pretty much count on trade animosity between the US and China continuing. You got the shipping crisis. So these things are changing. But you know, as I say in the book, I am dubious that the further away we get from the pandemic, uh, this will stick because the simple fact is that if you are running a company that's publicly traded and you're suggesting that we move production away from the lowest cost provider, or we think about more redundancy, or let's put more parts in a warehouse, you're essentially arguing, let's dilute the next quarter's earnings, and Wall Street might punish you for that. Yeah. And by the time some crisis happens that will reveal that we should all be grateful that you took these steps, there's a good chance you're out of a job. Whereas if you're right. still saying, let's carry on with the same sort of globalization that we've all lived through for the last three decades, there will be a shock. I mean, there will be another pandemic, a typhoon, you know, who knows, something we're not thinking about that will reveal that as folly. But with any luck, by then, you know, you'll be on some beach, you know, in a hammock hoisting a cocktail. It'll, it'll happen on somebody else's watch. And that short-termism that has driven our particular kind of capitalism and globalization is still with us. Yeah. I mean, basically, if you're arguing for those sorts of redundancies, because so much of executive compensation is tied to the stock price, you're basically arguing for cutting your own pay, which uh, they are probably right. pretty unlikely to go in that direction. Um, I just want to say to people, it is a wonky subject. It's a very readable book. Um, you take us through a small businessman in what was it, Mississippi, Mississippi who's trying to get yeah. his product manufactured in time for right. Christmas. 
And you use that as a story to go through each of these pieces of the supply chain, which completely collapsed during COVID and help us make sense retrospectively of some of the things we were experiencing in our own lives and draw some lessons from the future. I really highly recommend it. And I really appreciate you, Peter, taking some time with us this morning. Oh, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for your excellent questions. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.